Okay, hang on. Oh, okay. Okay, now. They should want to copy the picture <laughs> for her next PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> so, other than Kim and Heron and Dean, I don't know anybody. Are you guys from this area in general? Yes. Yes? Yes. Have you been on Lake Toho before? Yes. No. Once. Last year were the Hydrilla Awareness Day. Right. right. But not not other than that? That's it. Okay. <coughs> so Lake Toho is uh, about an 18,000 acre lake. And uh, I, I work with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. And we are the lead resource managers of public lands throughout the state, with the exception of the State Park Service, uh, federal lands, and some areas that are managed by the water management districts. So we have the responsibility for trying to maintain a balance on all the, the natural systems out here. And I work exclusively with aquatic plant management. So uh, Lake Toho is near and dear to my heart and it's where I have spent the majority of my time over the last couple of years. So on this lake we've got a variety of native and non-native plants, uh, plants that are causing problems, plants that are disappearing that we would like to see come back and we're trying to manage for all those things. As you look around you can see you know, dense stands of vegetation along the shoreline here, the majority of which is cattails. We're sitting in a patch of what some people call smart weed, other people call not weed. Underneath the surface of the water is a, uh, a species of water primrose. As we get a little bit deeper, what Dean just pulled up on his rake is hydr <coughs> excuse me, hydrilla that has uh, a, a long and uh, elusive history on, on the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes. So what we're trying to do is to, to take into account all the uses of the, the resource out here. We've got pleasure boaters who uh, want completely open water so that they can you know, take pontoon boats and john boats up and down the lake. We've got a federal navigation channel that starts at the city of Kissimmee and goes all the way to Lake Okeechobee and then east to the Atlantic and west of the Gulf. We have duck hunters that want uh, conditions out here to bring in a lot of ducks so that you know, they can shoot ducks a couple months a year. We've got bass anglers, and they want conditions out here to make it easy to catch a lot of trophy bass. And then we've got flood protection interests, because we have water control structures on the lake, we've got to be able to move water through in, in the event of a hurricane. And last and not least, we have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service representing an endangered species, which is the Everglades snail kite. So we have all those players at the table saying, I want this, I want this, I want this. And I'm the one in the middle trying to draw a plan to please everybody. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service usually has the last say because the Endangered Species Act pretty much comes out on top of everything else. So what, what we see is uh, an ever-changing landscape of resource management out here. We do a lot of work along the shoreline by helicopter to try to get out some of the more dense areas of cattails and get back to uh, a variety of you know, less dense emergent vegetation. We do constant work on water hyacinth and water lettuce out here. And I don't know what you have seen pictures of, excuse me, back at the, uh, at the pavilion there. There's actually one little piece of water lettuce floating over here in the lake. And what we find is the plants that cause the problems out here for us are either uh, non-native plants or plants that are invasive or aggressive or have an advantage in one way or another. And they tend to outcompete everything else because this whole system is kind of out of kilter thanks to the, uh, the dredging work started by Hamilton Diston, followed up by the Corps of Engineers and managed by the South Florida Water Management District. So we're, we're we're managing the water levels on these lakes in a completely unnatural situation, and the lake is responding to that, but it's responding in a way that causes problems for you know all the people that are competing for the resources out here. 
My turn? Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to focus on hydrilla. A little history about the plant and our efforts here on the lake. You're not going to see a whole lot today because of the treatment, the recent treatment efforts and the severe COVID that we've had again this year. But it's here. I think Ed said in the previous talk he estimated about 10,000 acres uh, prior to our treatment efforts this year. Sorry. Uh, hydrilla was introduced to Florida in the 1950s by the aquarium trade. Uh, some tropical fish dealers in Tampa and Miami planted it in nearby canals and retention ponds. And in 20 years it grew from uh, those isolated plantings to pretty much as most of the larger water bodies in the world. 